this week on I Am Inspired Now. I give you my secrets to how I look young at 39, supposedly. I'll chat a bit about how I'm going to take the month of July off from booze, how I'm excited about having some well-known travel personalities on my podcast, and last but not least, I'm so proud of myself because I got my short story published, and I'll be reading the little story I wrote at the end of the podcast. No! I hope everyone is doing well today. You, I mean you, you one solitary listener. I hope you enjoy the episode. So, I was told the other day that I looked really young. I said to the girls, I'm actually 39. They were quite bemused by this and I showed them my license. And then they giggled uncontrollably. They were pretty cute girls. I mean cute girls as in they are lovely girls. They were attractive but obviously too young for me and I'm married but this made me quite happy because on the Saturday that I was working that that has just gone I wasn't really up uh, for work I really wanted to be home so compliments to those two girls that were working at Co and Co Cafe in Port Melbourne on Saturday thank you so the reason why I think I look young is that I have great genes Mum and dad look young. They're around 72, 73 years old. And I reckon they look about 10 years younger. Dad still has black hair and mum still has blonde hair. They work out. They go to the gym. They they just know how to look after themselves. So I always tend to try and use moisturizer on my face as much as I can. Slapping on the sunscreen in the summer months. I want to try and look after myself as much as possible i'm aware of what the sun can do to your skin and the damages that it does do i've got a new routine it's a skin routine that i like to do now so now i cleanse i tone and moisturize i never used to do that stuff before i used to only just moisturize so the other day mandy and i were in the city looking for a present for my brother-in-law tim and we decided that we wanted to get him some fragrance or some skin products. We looked for some fragrance, couldn't find it. They were just too expensive. And then we thought about skin products. And we ended up going to Aesop in the city in Maya. Maya is a big department store in Melbourne, Australia. So if you're ever tra- traveling to Melbourne, go to Maya. It's a great place. But we went to Aesop in Maya and bought some skin products for him which I'm pretty sure he's using because I I know he wants to try and look after himself. But, you know, the problem with Aesop is it's too bloody expensive. It's the most expensive moisturizing creams and, and just stuff. It's, it's expensive because it's natural. So I bought some skin products as well from Aesop, which Mandy initially wasn't very happy with me because it cost hundreds of dollars. And she just wanted to make sure I was going to use it. So I'm going to stick to this. If you want to know what Aesop is, it's an Aussie brand, but they sold their souls to Brazilians. Their head office and logistics are apparently still in Melbourne, I think Fitzroy, as well as their manufacturing. And someone from Aesop said they didn't sell everything. So they still have some type of control and their product's still coming from Australia, but it's just mainly owned by Brazilians. Whatever that, whatever that is. So I bought three products from Aesop for my face. That is the Fabulous Face Cleanser. I use that in the shower. The ingredients are as follows. Bergamot rind, chamomile blend, and rosemary leaf. So all natural. It's great. Once I'm out of the shower, I use B&T Balancing Toner. Apparently, this brings the pH levels of the skin back to normal. Whatever normal is. The ingredients for that is sodium gluconate panthenol and green tea so after i've used that toner toner after i've toned my face and neck i use moroccan neroli post shave lotion which i apply generally generally or yeah generally to my face and neck it's a lovely feeling moisture it feels great it has sandalwood neroli blossom and panthenol 
whatever panthenol is. Look, send me an email or a message online. Let me know if you know what panthenol is, because I don't know what panthenol is, and I'd really like to know what I'm putting on my skin. Sorry about that. I just burped. Uh, so this is my new routine. I'm going to stick with this routine until I've run out. See how it goes. See if my skin's gotten better. I haven't taken a before or after picture of my face, but I probably should have done that. Thinking about it now, that would have been a really good idea. So this episode isn't brought to you by Aesop. I promise you not. It is not brought to you by Aesop. So taking a month off alcohol as well. I think that's going to help the the skin as well. But I'm going to do dry July with my friend Sam. Mandy would do it also. People usually do it to raise funds for people affected by cancer. I haven't signed up to the website. I don't know if I will. I definitely want to just do this for my own health. I want to lose weight. So I think drinking no alcohol is going to really help me. I drink too much booze as it is. My favorite booze is beer, red wine, and whiskey. And that's in no particular order, but not all together. Otherwise, I'd get very drunk and it'd probably taste disgusting. So cutting out booze for a month will be difficult, but good for me. And I'm ready for the challenge and I really want to do this. I'll be having my first drink in Hong Kong at the end of July, early August. So there's something to look forward to and I can't wait for that time off away. I feel the time I spent in Bali this year was not good enough. I didn't get rid of my ailments so I think this three and a half weeks, four weeks that I've got coming up in August, end of July, all of August pretty much, will will help my body. I'm feeling just sore at the moment, so it's I'm feeling a bit cruddy. So that would be great. <laughs> I also found out there's a thing called Sober October. So I don't know if you know what Sober October is, but apparently there's a Sober October, there's Dry July, so there's two months in a year that I could probably go without alcohol, but... I don't know if I'm going to do that because October is Mandy's birthday. So she's born on the 3rd of October. So I don't want to do sober October because I generally I want to have a beer or a glass of red wine with Mandy on her birthday. So that's good. That's good. Also, I'm super excited to be having some well-known travel personalities on my podcast. I'll be doing some more YouTube with my mate Chris Rainey from Yellow Productions, who's amassed over 100 and 38,000 subscribers. Well done, pal. Uh, we'll be probably chatting about, I think, American restaurants in Australia. But that may change. I'm not sure. But it will be live at some stage. I'm just doing the show notes as we speak. I've just had a, a Twitter message back from Alex Hunter from Attaché, which is a very well-known travel channel on YouTube. It's kind of in the vein of Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations. Alex has around 138,000 subscribers and I'll be interviewing him on the podcast soon. So I'm really excited for that. I have an interview with Mark Walters from Walters World lined up. Mark's travel channel on YouTube has a whopping 552,000 subscribers. So that's, that's awesome. He'll be coming on to the podcast and we'll be talking travel and stuff like that. He's got a family that he travels with a lot. So we'll be talking about He's traveling with his family. He's also famous for his don'ts of traveling and the 10 things that shock travelers. So it'll be good to talk to Mark about how he came up with those ideas because I I remember initially when I came across his uh, YouTube channel, I thought, I don't know about talking about the don'ts of traveling or the 10 things that shock travelers. I think that comes across as quite negative. But once you actually listen to his YouTube and what he's trying to say, you figure out, geez, I really need to know this. This is great. This is great information. Um, I'll also be chatting to Josh Cahill live, probably here in the studio in Melbourne. He hosts the YouTube channel Go Travel Your Way, which has 112,000 subscribers. Josh's channel reviews airlines, the food, the comfort, the convenience. Uh, His show is great if you really want to know the best airlines to travel with and if you want to know how how the experience of flying business classes and different airlines and watch Joe's show, it's quite good. He'll he'll show you from when he boards to when he 
disembarks the airline. So that's really cool. I love Josh's um, YouTube channel. It's great. So it'll be good to talk to Josh. I'll also be chatting to Joe McPherson. He's the founder of Zen Kimchi Food Tours. We'll be chatting about Korean food and uh, Korean travel and probably a host of other things. There'll be a blast and I can't wait. I'm excited to speak to Joe and Joe is actually, he works with Sean Morrissey who I've had on the podcast. We talked about dark tourism, if you don't remember. That was on the Travel Man podcast. Joe has also met one of my heroes, Anthony Bourdain. Love that guy. Uh, I've also got an interview lined up with Joel Beers. He's the theatre critic from the OC Weekly uh, newspaper and online publication from Orange County, California. I met Joel in LA's downtown, a Grand Central Market last year. I remember drinking beers, talking travel. We ate main lobster rolls. Well, I ate a main lobster roll. And his story is really unique, and I can't wait to hear it and for you to hear it. He's the guy that's visited all 50 states of America. So that's really cool. And I will now talk about Pinecone on the Roof by Verge Uncanny 2019. The book is a publication of Monash University, so Monash University's publishing department. And I finished with having my story in the book, so it was one of the top 30-plus entries. And here it is now. I really want to read to you this story. Okay, here we go. The Pinecone on the Roof. I was his gardener for years but I didn't cut a single blade of grass. It all started with a call. I listened to his calm voice and his requirements. I assumed I could accomplish all he wanted if I visited every three weeks. He sounded nice, but assertive. His name was Paul. He had slick blonde hair, wore black skinny jeans, a light grey vest and Dunlop follies. On my first visit, he had me pruning his lemon tree, mowing his lawn and weeding a bed of irises. He'd tell me outlandish stories about previous workers he'd had and things that he'd gotten up to that keep me entertained as I toiled away. He'd had many gardeners before me, he said, and his reasons for dismissing them were various. One guy would sit out in the middle of the lawn and pray to some god of his, Buddhist or something. He didn't say exactly. Another just stopped turning up after a while. People were unreliable. Paul said I was different. I'd gotten to know his neighbour across the road. He was double Paul's age and called Red. Red knew a bullshit artist when he saw one. I liked Red. He was direct and he hired me to look after his roses. Paul liked Red, he said. He liked racing him out to the emptied garbage bins just to prove that even though he was younger, he woke up earlier and was a better person because of it. Paul wasn't jealous that I was Red's gardener as well. He embraced it. It's five years to the day since I finished working for Paul. I still have fond memories of working in his garden, raking up liquid amber leaves in autumn, mowing his buffalo grass, smelling the freshly cut lawn. It feels like yesterday. I look over the road when I work at Red's and wonder what happened at Paul's. His garden is overgrown now, as if it has never been touched. The grass is high, the trees wild. I've never seen Paul come out and neither has Red. We know he's there, or has been. Red would tell me how Paul was different, strange even. Paul had issues. If he wasn't sick, he had accidents. If he wasn't having accidents, he'd be between jobs. I never knew what was real. He'd call his wife by other names and reminisce about jobs he once had, Red told me. Pigeon breeder, aprist, spy, costume designer to the stars, shoemaker. Everything about his life was weird. Paul once put a pine cone on the top of my truck's cabin and told me that if something ever happened to him, I could smell and touch the cone and they would be the things that I needed to do to remember him by. I was up my long ladder and about to trim a hedge at Red's when it occurred to me. I couldn't remember exactly when I worked for Paul. Whatever it was, summer or winter or a Monday or a Wednesday, and how many hours I did for him. I forgot what Paul looked like. 
When I tried to remember his face, his eyes merged with his nose, and then his cheekbones. In my mind, his mouth was a narrow, endless tunnel into which I might tumble if I wasn't careful. As I left Red's one day, I opened my glove box and came across a pine cone. I looked across the road as the wind picked up. The liquid amber that used to stand so handsomely in Paul's front garden was limp and frail. It hadn't had leaves for years. I hope you like the story. And if you want to follow me, you can follow me on Instagram where I'm Travelman Podcast, on Twitter, Travelman Pod. My email is travelmanpodcast at gmail.com. You can go to www.travelmanpodcast.com to hear my podcast. You can listen to my podcast on Podcast Addict and a lot of different podcast apps. And I'm also on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and a bunch of others. So thanks again for listening to my podcast. Remember, this is the side part of my Travel Man podcast. And ta-ta and see you later. Bye-bye.